So David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hans. Uh, thank you, Sam, for inviting me along to provide this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, tuning in or taking the time to listen to this uh, sometime in the future after it's recorded. Um, I've called this uh, presentation using human-centered design to improve energy efficiency programs. Um, I'll just uh, run you through a, a quick uh, introduction to myself my slide works ah oh, there we go okay so uh, i'm david pryor i'm a senior team leader in the energy markets team at department of planning industry and environment here in new south wales uh, i've been around in these uh, programs since 2006 when i started to work at the independent pricing and regulatory tribunal my part on uh, GGAS, uh, which was uh, the greenhouse gas abatement scheme in New South Wales, which was the world's first mandatory carbon trading program. Uh, so I've been around since the ESS started in 2009. And now the team that I'm leading, we, we work on developing the rules for the energy savings scheme. We work on uh, making sure the scheme actually uh, works by linking up to other programs, especially related to the Climate Change Fund in New South Wales. And also we're looking at opportunities to modernize and scale delivery of the energy savings scheme. Um, today's agenda, I'm just gonna run through some introductions um, to the scheme, talk a little bit about the Energy Security Safeguard, which is a new uh, reconstituted version of the energy savings scheme that will be starting up in New South Wales uh, in coming uh, shortly. Uh, dig into the problem that we're trying to solve, uh, talk about our digital landscape uh, research and its outcomes, and just uh, round off with some things that we learned from the process. So I will um, say I'm um, a program um, person. I've been around these schemes, but really I'm not a human-centered design expert. So this is uh, us as government trying to uh, find out more about people and the programs that we run. So just a quick introduction to the Energy Savings Scheme, uh, or the ESS as we call it. It is a statutory scheme. It's designed to uh, increase energy efficiency markets in New South Wales. Um, as I said, we're planning industry environment. We uh, coordinate the scheme and it's administered by IPART. It's really designed to provide an incentive so that people would do better than best practice to go that extra yard and do uh, better energy efficiency than they would have. Hopefully, it drives their decision to do energy efficiency, brings down their cost rate of return or uh, lowers the payback period enough that they actually get better projects over the line than they would have otherwise. Uh, the scheme works. We have these accredited providers, uh, ACPs, we call them, but I've tried to reduce the jargon tonight. Um, those people who operate in the scheme who are accredited by IPART work with energy savers on projects for the energy savings that are made, energy saving certificates can be claimed. Um, there's a whole set of rules that we make uh, to calculate those energy savings. There's a legislated target for energy retailers and others in New South Wales who sell electricity uh, to buy those certificates and then to surrender them. The target this year is for 8.5% of their electricity sales. Uh, so far, since 2009, the scheme has uh, been able to uh, verify 14,000 gigawatt hours of savings uh, that have taken place to date. And then uh, for the methods where we have uh, some upfront savings built in, uh, there's another 17,000 gigawatt hours that are already locked in for the next 10 years. I'm only gonna to touch briefly on the energy security safeguard tonight which is uh, a new, well, I guess, um, shows a new lease of life for the energy savings scheme. Uh, Minister Keane in New South Wales released the energy electricity strategy at the end of 2019. 
Uh, that strategy has a whole uh, range of measures that are going to be implemented in New South Wales from renewable energy uh, to demand side management, batteries and storage, uh, and energy uh, security target for renew a reliable supply of electricity in New South Wales. For us in the energy savings scheme, uh, we'll be uh, reconstituting our scheme as the energy security safeguard that will happen hopefully this year and during 2020. So the announcements that came with that uh, were that the energy savings scheme will be extended to 2050 uh, in line with the New South Wales net zero uh, ambitions. Uh, the targets for the scheme, so we're 8.5% this year, will be increased to 13% by 2030. And there'll be an expanded set of activities to reduce electricity and gas demand, including introduction of new fuel types. Alongside the energy saving scheme, which is designed for energy efficiency, we'll have a peak demand reduction certificate scheme that was also being developed. So we appreciate that there's a new energy landscape uh, emerging that energy efficiency by itself may not be enough anymore, but energy efficiency and how we use it uh, in concert with batteries and pool pumps and EV chargers and being able to shift demand away from peak periods is going to be a really important uh, part of our future. So the research that I'm going to talk about in a minute uh, was commissioned before this came out. So um, in some ways it was prescient. A lot of the things that we have uh, discovered through the research are really uh, important pillars for the safeguard going forward. The problem we were trying to solve uh, in the energy saving scheme was really uh, uh, that we've done this research for that I'm about to go through um, was a lack of trust, I guess you could say. A, a little bit of a, uh, some issues, some drama creeping into the scheme. Um, this word clouds and that I've got here on the left, and uh, as you can see, the where do we want to be in five years from now on the right uh, here are uh, word clouds that we got from uh, doing Slido, um, where we had some, we put these two questions to an audience at our consultation forum on rule changes in August last year. So we felt that we were being uh, quite brave at the time by saying, you know, how would you describe the ESS right now? When we knew that we did have uh, stakeholders in the room who were um, not that happy with the way that the scheme had uh, evolved or was being managed uh, at, at the time. Uncertain, cumbersome, complex, adversarial. Um, you know, they're not the sort of uh, words that you want to see uh, when you're um, entrusted with you know, uh, running a scheme like this or being making sure that it functions well. But the upside is that when in five years from now, People want to see a strong legacy. They want more ambitious targets. They want less complexity. They want digital energy and real-time savings. So when we did this forum and we got these word clouds, we were also thinking at the same time, uh, if we wanted to move and be more digital ready and to make space to scale our scheme, what would we need to do? What uh, how would the stakeholders that we have need to change? What would they need to update to be able to participate in a more digital ready scheme? That led us to our digital landscape research. So I'm going to present now um, that research that we did and uh, what we're doing with the outcomes. So just to start off with some context, uh, it was um, work that was co-created in a collaboration with DPI, that's, that's us, IPART, the certificate creators and auditors working within the energy savings scheme. 
I've tried to present here the research as uh, true to its outcomes as we got uh, working with Mentally Friendly, who were the uh, design agency that we worked with. But it's uh, important, I guess, to distinguish that it, it's not the government's view and it is um, part of a discovery research that we commissioned to try to explore the scheme in a bit more detail. The vision that we had is that we want to accelerate, we want to accelerate verifiable energy savings and future proof the energy saving scheme for a changing energy landscape. Everyone was able to agree uh, on this vision for the research in our early um, parts of it. The approach, we worked with Mentally Friendly over four weeks to conduct research and identify opportunities to improve operation of the energy saving scheme. We looked at the roles of stakeholders and participants in the scheme. We looked at the state of current tools and processes that people use and on the impacts of our, the changes that we make to rules and how they impact stakeholders as part of the process. Uh, the research took in 72 hours of interviews and workshops with scheme participants. Um, an important part here is that myself and one of my team members, uh, we made ourselves available as much as we could to actually uh, be involved in the research um, to, uh, with uh, Mentally Friendly, uh, to be involved in each of the co-design workshops um, and so that we weren't just getting the insights uh, relayed to us from the consultant, but that we were there uh, on the journey with the consultant through the process. We made sure that we looked at a whole lot of different roles uh, of, that people play in the energy saving scheme. We looked at the digital readiness of people who operate in the scheme from people who, uh, companies who are fully paper-based, um, to those who are basically uh, already have fully automated and digital systems. There's some different types of business models and we looked at people who operate uh, in the New South Wales scheme, but also uh, operate from different jurisdictions in other uh, energy efficiency obligation schemes in Australia. So, we went through the research, we find some issues and we co-designed and assessed six opportunity areas. Um, I'm gonna go through those insights and the opportunity areas in more detail. I've just wanted to add in this uh, slide here, which shows you a bit of the landscape uh, of how things all fit together. We've got IPART, the administrator of the scheme, closely linked to the auditors who ensure that energy savings are verified and um, that energy savings are legitimate through the scheme. We've got the certificate providers who are interested in commercial success and they want confidence in the scheme. Uh, they have to do a lot of quality assurance. There's documentation. They have installers who work for them or are part of their companies. And then there's uh, us at the planning industry and environment who are working on the legislation. Key insights and opportunities that we got from the research um, is that uh, right now in our uh, ecosystem, there's significant time spent on manual tasks. There's a fragment fragmentation of uh, tools and systems. Certificate providers aren't really equipped for rule changes to deal with them. Uh, we need some better feedback loops. There's some siloed data and the complexity of the scheme uh, prevents people from engaging. What we ended up finding through these uh, opportunity areas is that there's opportunities for us to streamline manual data processes, uh, to investigate a single source of truth platform for uh, operating the scheme, uh, that we should investigate some smart legislation and uh, opportunities in that area, uh, transparent rules, more effective M&V, measurement and verification, and trying to bring energy savings closer to the end user. The insights here, I'm just gonna go through um, insights one and two, and then opportunities one and two, uh, and then do it that way. So manual tasks are really um, something that is really time consuming. We've got people having problems with accuracy of data. 
uh, ACP is saying that the interaction of the with the digital systems we've got now is incredibly manual. There's a lot of evidence required and transcription required between one uh, set of information and the other. And it's not helped because tools and frag and uh, systems that make up the scheme are quite fragmented. So there's not a unified view of connecting jobs that happen on the site to the energy saving certificates that are made. It's hard to track the life cycle of the project. Um, systems that are there uh, have been built, uh, some of them together, but also they operate uh, they've been built alongside each other and they don't all work as well as we would hope as a system. The opportunity areas that we found out of these two uh, issues is that streamlining manual data processes will really would be a benefit for everybody, legislators, administrators and implementers. Um, doubling handling, you know, increases in inefficiencies and um, we think that there's a lot uh, that we can get out of streamlining these systems. To do that, uh, a more unified platform so that there's a single source of truth for the energy savings that go from a project through to being registered, um, yeah, we think is really important. We had some accredited certificate providers who are saying oh, that they have 13 or 14 different systems just to manage the creation of commercial lighting certificates. So they've got installers using one thing, they're uploading data in other ways, they're putting things in and out of Excel. Uh, it's a really, uh, there's a lot of make work happening to get these uh, energy savings projects verified and into the system. What we're doing um, so far, or we're planning to do in New South Wales uh, on streamlining the manual data processes is working with IPART, the administrator, to develop an upgraded portal and registry uh, for the safeguard. And um, we're trying to work towards a user-centered uh, platform to view and maintain those, a prototype, sorry, of those uh, as part of that creation process. What happens next is that we'll be testing that prototype and opportunities to inform a business case uh, for future platforms to create uh, support energy savings certificate creation. The third of the insights that we found there was that certificate providers aren't really equipped to interpret rule changes. Uh, we have a lot of people who operate in this scheme who are technical. They're good at putting in the right air conditioning or upgrading um, lighting or compressed air. But their strength isn't a legal background. So really we need to make sure that the systems that we have and the rules that we develop are understandable. Um, we need more plain English and there's a lot of complexity in interpretation. Also, the feedback we got was that rule changes are missing consistent and effective feedback loops. So it's hard to know what's happening on the ground, how our rule changes will affect people, what it will take for companies to change their digital systems or try it, retrain staff uh, where we make updates to the rules and the requirements of the scheme. Trying to give feedback in a day is hard. We want people, you know, don't want more updates than they need to get. Um, companies we hear um, will just be ready to have a whole well, upgraded all their systems and rolled out uh, their processes to reflect the changes that we've made and then we make another change and they have to start again. We thought that through the research we found that smart legislation and uh, coded rules would be a way uh, to help with this process. So being able to model impacts of rule changes, uh, being able to ensure that the policy intent that we have when we make rules is able to flow through to the end users, uh, it would help this process. Installers are a long way from the space regulated by IPART. 
certificate creation is not their job. That's a typo there, I'll fix later on. Um, you know, we've had cases where there's evidence requirements that are created that are at odds with safety. Those types of things just can't happen. We need a more transparent and collaborative rule change process to help with this. So feedback loops are important, making changes to policy that we can, you know, constructive and uh, considered way so we can anticipate people's impacts, make sure people's voices are heard. Um, we think that there's a way, we would like to work on a way to create better feedback loops so that uh, people who are in the community, who are the stakeholders who are operating in the scheme are able to import uh, more into the process. The opportunities that we're pursuing uh, here is that in smart legislation space, we're working with the Department of Customer Service on uh, rules as code. So that's a whole, there's a whole uh, a lot of information out there on the internet that you could find if you started to look in the rules as code space. We're trying to develop a digital version, of small parts of the ESS rule. And there's a neighbor's methodology for commercial energy safe, commercial buildings, energy savings. And we're testing that with users. We're also working on making uh, progress in the transparent and collaborative rule change process by investigating a better rules framework from New Zealand and improving our process of consulting and drafting rules. We're building in more opportunities for collaboration as we prepare for our next rule change process. And we're extending that ambition to uh, see if we can code the whole of the energy saving scheme rule and then eventually make APIs available for people. Uh, the fifth insight that we had, uh, that we found through the research, was that data from the scheme and the way it's collected is preventing us from making it the best scheme we can. Um, lack of data is a, bar a barrier for us identifying new sectors where we could have products or um, things available in the scheme for it to be used. Information that's captured isn't necessarily as clean as we would like it to be. It can be missing information and helps, that makes it hard for us to extract and analyze it, and make data-driven policy decisions. And then there's the complexity of the scheme. It prevents end users from engaging. The scheme is complex. It's hard to explain and understand. Um, this reduces the ability for end users to understand their role. And it also makes it hard for certificate providers to engage with end users and for them to be able to uh, sell projects and get people to uh, engage with the scheme. The calculations are so complex, says one ACP, it's tricky to give a customer an answer on the spot. Complexity in the scheme prevents small businesses from understanding and participating. They're issues that we really need to address to remove barriers to entry. One of the things that we are pursuing in this space is more effective measurement and verification. We think that uh, having overly complex systems and calculation methodologies um, re is a real uh, issue and is something that we need to address. Uh, we would like to be able to test policy changes with better data and to uh, design M and V measurement and verification in a much more robust way that can be easily used. It was also an opportunity uh, seen for us to bring energy savings closer to the end user. So lowering a barrier to entry for end users, reducing unnecessary complexity and encouraging participants uh, to drive behavior change. Um, we see this would 
increase awareness uh, from end users, uh, drive more energy savings. There's an opportunity for real time savings to drive behavior change if they're linked to ongoing incentives. Um, there are some risks in this though, because a lot of people, especially once we get into the residential space, uh, they just want their incentives and they want their energy savings, but they don't really want to engage with the scheme. So there are things we really need to design well to make this work. What we're doing in this space is we're testing advanced MV 2.0 methods, uh, trying to demonstrate the use of hourly energy, uh, hourly energy profiles, so we can see the effects of um, temperature and energy use on buildings throughout the day and throughout the year, uh, and try to work to develop new methodologies, simple methods for the energy saving scheme. We're about to start a new human centered design uh, work stream to explore that M and V and simplified methods for calculating energy savings and ensuring compliance. Uh, we're hoping to bring those energy savings closer to the end user by investigating pay for performance programs and we're working with other states and uh, linking in with international schemes where we can. It's a big challenge for MV 2.0 and pay for performance to succeed. We need more data, we need the right mix of savings, uh, we need privacy, finance, simple compliance. Uh, there's a lot to do in this space to make it work. One of the most exciting things that we did out of this work, out of the research, once we got these opportunities uh, mapped out, was to think about how we would implement them. Is there a way that we could break down these uh, issues into a work stream that would go out to 2030 and would allow us to uh, make the changes that were um, that we found would be you know, great to do through the research. And we did this through some co-design as part of their engagement with Mentally Friendly, where we all got in a room and um, worked out uh, those key risks, looked at all of those opportunities and uh, issues and set out to try to map three horizons. So what could we do now, uh, piloting uh, energy savings? What could we do to accelerate and modernize energy savings? What could we do to then make it more transparent and accessible? And then our vision at the time was to make energy savings business as usual by 2030. The pilot program would be to prototype and validate a unified platform. So bringing together those opportunity areas one and two, um, looking at evidence-based recommendations for then how we would build a new platform. This becomes really important in the context of our expanded uh, energy security safeguard and our expansion to 2050, that actually we really need to move from those away from those legacy systems into something that's fit for, for purpose uh, going forward. The vision to accelerate and modernize energy savings from 20 through to 2022 was about really building out that energy savings platform, linking in smart legislation, improving our rule change process, integrating MV 2.0. The second horizon that we looked at um, was about then making those savings more transparent and accessible, leveraging the data, expanding the energy savings into new sectors, looking at end-to-end -end energy savings platforms, uh, making the API integration that we dream about now a reality, prototyping some public access to make the energy saver being closer to the energy savings, and really working on simplifying the data, analyzing what we've got there in the scheme and making it um, as simple as we can um, going forward. Our future horizon 2025 to 2030 and making energy savings business as usual really 
focusing on driving behavior change through digitally integrated systems. So connecting nationally and internationally, having an integrated system that's smart enough to uh, basically for us to be able to um, do that uh, integrated energy efficiency and demand management uh, behind the meter, looking at more sophisticated modeling to inform behavior change. Bring that all together into the roadmap. We looked at piloting the program, validating prototypes, investigating data security and privacy, streamlining manual data processes. Once we go to that acceleration phase, we've got the unified platform, smart legislation and MV 2.0, start to bring in end-to-end -end energy savings and simplifying data and API as we make those savings more transparent. And then as we get to business as usual, towards the horizon in 2030, uh, really driving behavior change, connecting nationally, internationally, sophisticated energy modeling. So there's a lot to take in there with a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, what did we learn? I was looking for something here to, um, to talk about in terms of human centered design and what we learned from the process. And um, actually I found this um, four points from Don Norman, a uh, guru of the human centered design uh, community. Um, really, you know, for us being involved in the research and um, going through this process with our stakeholders and being having the time to reflect on how the energy saving scheme has performed over 10 years, the takeaway is that we need empathy and we need to focus on all users. We can't just focus on fixing things for the administrator. We can't fix, focus on fixing things for us in policy and delivery. And we can't focus only uh, on the credit certificate providers or the end user. We need to take an approach that, uh, as Don Norman says here, ensure we solve the core root issues, not just the problems that are presented. Um, we need to focus on people and uh, that's where the empathy comes in. We need to take a systems point of view and we need to continually test and refine our proposals uh, to make sure that we're not going too far down one track before we have to turn around and come back uh, to another space. So that's my monologue for uh, presentation so far. Uh, hands, I guess I'll uh, hand it over to um, to you and Sam to uh, just take things forward and through to the Q&A.